Thank you all for joining us here again at I-80 Sports, where today we're talking about a tale of two cities, where Boston has been succeeding, Vancouver has been failing. Let us know what you guys think. You're here for another episode of NHL at I-80 Sports. Thank you all for joining us here again at I-80 Sports. Make sure that you hit subscribe down below, youtube.com slash I-80 Sports. And hit subscribe, hit the bell notification so that way you guys know when we go live. And also drop a comment down below with what you think about Boston season so far. And chime in down below on how you think Vancouver could turn things around, especially after all of the new changes in Vancouver lately, which we're going to be talking about in just a second. And if you're on Twitter, make sure you follow us down below at I-80 underscore sports NHL. And if you follow us already, thank you guys so much for all of your support because we greatly value it. But... Time to launch into this. I'm Brian. He's Tom. Tom, how are you doing today? Doing well, doing well. And here we are, a tale of two cities. And um, a tale of two cities that had a little bit to do with each other a little over 10 years ago. And one of those cities still harbors a lot of hatred towards the other one. But this time around, they're not directly involved with each other, but they're definitely on opposite ends of the spectrum, if you want to say it that way. I found it really interesting that we're at this point in the season and we're talking about really two polar opposites right now with the Boston Bruins and the Vancouver Canucks. And we're a decade removed from that intense, insane Stanley Cup series. Uh, Well, more than a decade removed, but even still, you know, you look at the trajectory of both of these teams and where they've been since, and it's certainly different. And this season is totally polar opposite so we're going to be talking exclusively about the boston bruins and vancouver canucks in this episode we're not going to start with our traffic report like we normally do just because it's a light news week going into the all-star break when we get to next week we'll certainly do a news catch up and also talk about our mid-season grades but just so that way you guys don't miss out down below if you're watching the video here and not listening on your favorite streaming platform you can check out any news from this past week down below and react as well down below in the comment section but we're gonna start right from the get-go we're pumping the brakes right from the get-go let's get into this main headline time to pump the brakes not so fast it's time to pump the brakes so we felt like we really needed to talk about this this time around originally we were planning to do our mid-season grades but Boston has been on such a historic run so far this season in the regular season we're going to talk about that obviously in just a second we'll, we'll run down the stats but Vancouver has just been so underperforming this year that it's staggering and it's such a talking point that we need to talk about the polar opposites right now between the Boston Bruins and the Vancouver Canucks, where one team has failed, another team has really found success where we really didn't feel like there was going to be success made. So let's start by talking about the Boston Bruins here. We're going to talk about the Boston Bruins' uh, most recent success. So I'm just going to run down some stats, some team stats, uh, courtesy of HockeyReference.com, and just talking about the Boston Bruins first. So Boston's record currently uh, 46 games into the regular season, or sorry, 45 games into the regular season for them, uh, is currently 36, five and four. That's 36 wins, five losses, four overtime losses. They are off to an amazing start. They're not only number one in the Atlantic division right now, but they're number one in the entire NHL by a wide margin right now. And, uh, Their goals for at the moment, they're second in the league for goals for with 173 goals uh, for, but they're first in the entire NHL in goals against. Only 96 goals against to start the season so far. Uh, Just really, really, really impressive for the Boston Bruins uh, to start this season. Um, One 
thing I do want to mention here for uh, any kind of stat buffs at the moment, uh, advanced stat buffs, uh, their SRS at the moment is number one in the entire NHL as well uh, with a 1.67 SRS at the moment, which is fantastic. Um, launching more down below, just talking about some stats here and scrolling through hockey reference here. Let's talk about who's really uh, pulling this team forward at the moment. David Pasternak is off to a fantastic start this season uh, with 63 points and 45 games played uh, 35 goals to couple with that. He is currently in the top five in goals uh, in the entire NHL at the moment, Brad Marchand, who missed a chunk of time to start this season, but admittedly not, as large a chunk that I thought he was going to uh, miss has 43 points in 37 games so far. He has not missed a beat at all to start this season. David Krejci, who recently returned this season from Boston Bruins as well, 37 points in 40 games at the age of oh God, how old is Krejci at this point? Is he 37 or is 35? He... I believe I think Bergeron's older than him, believe it or not. I think Bergeron's 37 and Krejci's 36. 36. Okay. Krejci is 36 and Bergeron. Uh, Bergeron is in fact 37. That is true. Uh, and Bergeron 36 points in 45 uh, games. We're going to talk about possible load management there with uh, Patrice Bergeron as well. That's going to be interesting to note too. Uh, one player that Boston is going to miss going forward is Jake DeBrusque, uh, who's going to be out for potentially the rest of the season could come back towards the end. Maybe could be a playoff uh, uh, person to come back later on this season. It it is indeed possible that he does, the, although a broken fibula is tough to come back from in a span of a regular season. He had 30 points in 36 games and was off to one of the best starts in his entire career. Uh, but you've also had a number of other players that I'm going to talk about in a little bit that have been key contributors to this Boston team as well. Uh, probably the biggest contributor has been their goaltending. Linus Olmark is off to a Vezina and Jennings caliber start for a goaltender at the moment in 28 starts so far. He's 24 and two at the moment, which is absurd. He has a 937 save percentage and a 1.88 goals against. That is elite at the moment. Jeremy Swayman, who's been backing up, has done quite well as well. 16 starts so far on the season. He's 11, three and three with a 916 save percentage and a 2.27 goals against average. That is one of the biggest reasons why Boston has been so successful to start this season. So Tom, I'm going to let you expound on this a little bit and expand on what I was just talking about here and talking about Boston's success. I'm going to, in my segment, talk about the line combinations and how that has certainly uh, contributed as well for the Boston Bruins. But Tom, I want to hear from you uh, for a while on this one. Why is Boston off to such a hot start? Will this be sustainable for the rest of the season? What are your thoughts in general on Boston's season thus far? Okay, well, to me, it's the depth of the roster and just basically the understanding between the coaches and the players. You look at this team top to bottom, you look at their four lines or four forward lines or three deep pairs on both their goalies. It's a wow factor. I look up and down this lineup. I don't see one weak spot on this team at all. And granted, are they strong in every area? Yes, but are they at tops in every area? No, there's certain areas where there's players in other positions on other teams are better than individual players. Yes, but I see a team right now, you look up and down this lineup, reminiscent of maybe those late 90s Detroit teams, to tell you the truth. You know, those Detroit teams were able to run four solid lines, three solid deep pairs, and had the two-headed goalie monster. And 1997, at least, of Mike Vernon and Chris Osgood, which is eerily similar to Linus Allmark and Jeremy Swayman. I feel like that, you know what? You could probably start either one of these guys in the playoffs and they'll win you a bunch of games that could win you a cup. I think that, you know, if they if they sat Allmark down and started Swayman in the playoffs, I don't think this team would miss a beat. Detroit did the same thing in 97. They ran with Osgood as their primary guy most of the way, but who wound up winning the Conn Smythe for them that year? Mike Vernon wound up being their go-to guy in the playoffs. Same for 08 in Detroit where Hoshik was their guy most of the way. And then Osgood wound up being the guy who wound up winning them that cup that year. But I'll tell you the biggest thing with this group that, that's worked out for that's worked out in my eyes is the coaching. They hired Jim Montgomery over the summer, and the players seem to be very, very receptive to him. At the end of the day, Bruce Cassidy, his message had grown stale, and his influence had waned there. This team was fourth in the league in 08 and second in the East. In, uh, not in 08, in 18. Fourth in the league, second in the East. In 19, they were one win away from winning that vaunted second Stanley Cup with this uh, with this core. 
after that, they turned really into the middle of a road playoff team. In 2020, they won the President's Trophy. In 2021, they were a third place team. They did beat Washington in round one. They probably should beat the Islanders. They didn't. Last year, they were a wild card team. And while they pushed Carolina to the limit, they didn't get out of the first round. Well, I'm not technically labeling Jim Montgomery as a player's coach. I do believe he's more receptive to his players' thoughts and concerns and their opinions on the way certain things are ran. I got a funny feeling this didn't work with Bruce Cassidy. I got a funny feeling Cassidy was a, more of a tyrant, more of a John Tortorella light. And I understand maybe why he had to be this way. When he inherited the team, they had gotten rid of Claude Julian, who they had been through wars with. And he really inherited a fairly young team at the time. Obviously, you still had a, the core of Bergeron, Krejci, Marshawn, Chara, and Rez still there. But you got past those five guys who was a fairly young team who maybe needed a coach to crack the whip a little bit. The problem is, I think that after the, maybe they lost to St. Louis in 2019 and went out early in 2020, I wonder if this message went stale. I wonder if potentially this is why Tory Krug walked away from the Bruins to go to St. Louis. I wonder why if I wonder why if this is why David Krejci retired for the first time before he was brought back. And I really do wonder why it, when they sat down with Bergeron this summer, if he said the only way you come back is if this guy is not behind the bench anymore in Bruce Cassidy. I got a funny feeling they these players are more receptive to Montgomery. And Montgomery even said the other night when uh, Joe Micheletti, Rangers uh, color guy, interviewed him, he said these players are very receptive to being coached. Take what you will about that. Maybe they're just a little more receptive to Montgomery's message. And maybe he's a little more receptive to them as individuals and hockey players. And maybe he realizes that these guys now are mostly veterans and they don't need to have the whip cracked all the time. So that's a big thing with – that's one big thing with me. Another huge thing was the quick rehab of Brad Marchand and Charlie McAvoy. A lot of us, myself included, thought this team would be teetering on the bubble right now. And maybe when they when they came back, which I thought would maybe be around this time, they'd maybe sneak into a wild card spot. Well, those teams came back. Those guys came back early. Team was already winning. Sometimes when guys come back and the team's winning, it interrupts the flow. Didn't interrupt this flow. They literally just made the team better. And a lot of us, including myself, were wondering aloud, if Marshawn would ever play again with the hip surgery. Now, I know I also mentioned earlier, not really earlier, but in previous episodes, you have the age of guys like Bergeron and Krejci. We talked about that a little bit just, just now, a couple, couple minutes ago. That could very well still be a factor if one of them gets hurt long term. But at the same time, the Bruins already approached at least Patrice Bergeron. I don't know about Krejci. And maybe just talk to him about load management, resting him some games down the line. Maybe taking off a game against a team, say, like Anaheim. I don't know if they play Anaheim anymore this season. I'm just putting that in there as an example. Guys, don't take my word if they play Anaheim again. I don't know, and I apologize about that. But say a game like that against a weaker opponent, maybe they sit him down. And if you ask me, that's the best That's the best thing you can do right now. When you're in the situation they're in, which is right now they have a nice little cushion, and maybe that's what you want to do. As of right now, this team is on pace to win 65 games. That's going to break the all-time win record of 62, which is shared by the 95-96 Detroit Red Wings and the 2018-2019 Tampa Bay Lightning. So you all know we saw what happened with both. They didn't win. They didn't win. They didn't make it all the way to the cup. They didn't win the cup. I think management's well aware of both of those 60-plus win teams, and I think they're well aware that you know you can win 60 games all you want, but it matters about winning 16 games in the playoffs. Uh, I think they could break the record, yes, and I think it's on their mind, but I don't think that's the most paramount thing in their mind. And history has shown us with the Boston Bruins organization that they had two dominant teams in the past, the 1971 team and the 2014 teams. Dominated the regular season start to finish, but they both wound up going home early in the playoffs. At least this time around, they won't have to worry about the Montreal Canadiens like those other two teams did because Montreal always seems to be Boston's kryptonite. When they have a good season, as we already know, and as you're seeing on the bottom with all these Montreal injuries, it's almost a certainty that the Habs are not going to the playoffs this year. So I don't think the Bruins will need to worry about them, at least this time around. No, and, and a lot of good analysis there. And I'll start from behind the bench, and I'll work my way out on this one. You mentioned Jim Montgomery and his ability to coach this team. There was never any doubting. Jim Montgomery's ability to coach coming into this season. It was certainly going to be a change of pace for him coming back in to his, a head coaching job. Uh, as we last saw him in 2020 to 2022, he was with the St. Louis blues 
as an assistant coach under Craig Berube. And before that, he was the head coach of the Dallas Stars from 2018 to 2019, but abruptly left in the middle of that 2019-2020 season to check himself into alcohol rehab. And I'm happy to see that it seems like Jim Montgomery has certainly straightened himself out and really has the most talented team that he has ever coached in his coaching career at this point at the moment, or at least the most coachable team that he's ever had at the moment. He certainly had some good Dallas teams from 2018 to 2019 and certainly had a good St. Louis team that he helped coach uh, from 2020 to 2022. This Boston team, I think, is just playing on a completely different level at the moment. And I don't even know if it's that the talent is you know that much more, but I kind of want to just look at how they've balanced their lines uh, and this will be kind of stark contrast to what we're going to talk about later with the Vancouver Canucks, because with the Boston Bruins right now, you know what? I think it'll actually be easier if I just show you guys uh, this at the moment, because I think that would actually look a little bit nicer. So let's actually take a quick look and gander at uh, Boston's current lines at the moment there we go now we can actually see it because you know the iid sports logo was covering up before now it isn't so uh just looking up and down these lines the one thing to keep in mind is that jake debrusque would normally be fi filling in on that right wing side where craig smith is at the moment on that first line that's at least where he's been uh the majority of this season uh so right now that top line is brad marsh and patrice bergeron and craig smith and then that second line is Pavel Zaka, David Krejci, and David Pasternak. Last year, Brad Marchand, Patrice Bergeron, and David Pasternak was that first line. They've since moved David Pasternak to the second line to diversify their forwards a little bit more and to you know spread the depth out a little bit more. And we see that moving forward on the third line with Taylor Hall, Charlie Coyle, and Trent Frederick. You've got Taylor Hall, who the majority of his career has been a top six player, really playing an interesting role here for the Boston Bruins on the third line here. And he hasn't suffered. He hasn't suffered at all. He still has 30 points on the season in 40 games played. He's still contributing in a major way for the Boston Bruins. And then on the fourth line, you've got Nick Foligno, uh, Juno Kap uh, Kapanen, and A.J. Greer. A.J. Greer has really kind of held his own on, on this fourth line after being an AHL role player for the New Jersey Devils and New York Islanders before. And Nick Foligno just adds leadership to that bottom uh, bottom forward pairing and that bottom six in general. They've done a great job filling out the depth of this team. Everybody plays a role and everybody's picking each other up. And they score. They play fast. There's a good system in place for the Boston Bruins that Jim Montgomery has instituted this year. Whereas I feel like Bruce Cassidy, as Tom had mentioned before, didn't quite have that in place in the past few years with the Boston Bruins. Now we look down at the defensive pairings and it keeps getting even better with Matt Grizz looking Charlie McAvoy on the top pairing, Hampus Lindholm and Brandon Carlo on the second pairing. Hampus Lindholm, who in most other situations is your top defenseman on your team at the moment. And then Derek Forbort and Connor Clifton as your third pairing, which if Derek Forbort and Connor Clifton are your third pairing defenseman, I think you are plenty happy as any NHL team at the moment. This is a very good, very, very solid defense right now for the Boston Bruins. Looking at the power play units, just firepower all over the power play. Pavel Zaka playing a really good role in that second power play, being that Swiss Army knife with David Krejci running that power, that second power play unit at the moment. And like I was saying before, with where your depth is at the moment, Nick Foligno playing a key role in the second power play where he's only a fourth line guy on this team. He's finding his minutes. Then we go over to the first penalty kill. We see those role players again. Trent Frederick, who we saw on the third line before, playing a key role in the first penalty kill unit with Charlie Coyle. So you're keeping that third line together. Just no Taylor Hall in this one. Charlie McAvoy and Hampus Lindholm on that first pairing. Patrice Bergeron and Brad Marchand to kind of spice things up on that second penalty kill and do a great job. Brad Marchand is one of the best penalty killers in the entire NHL playing on the second penalty kill unit on the Boston Bruins right now. And then the goaltending, as I mentioned before, Linus Olmark and Jeremy Swayman. What else needs to be said about this tandem? Linus Olmark, at the moment, if the season ended today, he is far and away not only your Vezina Trophy winner and your Jennings winner, 
he might actually have a case for the Hart Trophy this year at the moment. I don't know. He might have a little case. I mean, ad- admittedly, there is this one guy. I don't There's know. There's this guy up in uh, Alberta might have a different idea about that. Yeah, I, what's his name again? Uh, like Connor McAvoy, Mac- McAdavid. Uh, Ma- yeah, Connor McDavid. Yeah. yeah, that's his name. I, yeah, it's not a household. There's name. another Connor in Saskatchewan who might be challenging him for that. And I'm going to talk name. about him. And he scored a couple goals. He's, he's, yeah. he's, he's scored a couple goals. We'll talk about him a different time. There's going to be plenty of time to talk about <laughs> him. But uh, just beat the Vancouver Canucks yesterday, which actually might be a perfect segue for right now. Because uh, where Boston has done very, very well this season, the Vancouver Canucks have done quite the opposite at the moment. Because this is a tale of two cities, and we can't talk about just how good the Boston Bruins have been. We also got to talk about how terrible the vancouver canucks have currently been which has been quite the uh exercise in futility at the moment so let's run down these stats for the vancouver canucks at the moment currently after i can do math um 46 games played they're 18 25 and 3 that's 18 wins 25 losses three overtime losses they're sixth in the Pacific Division at the moment, and I believe last I had checked, they're I think twenty eighth in the entire NHL. Not good. Um, currently, they are middle of the pack for goals for. They are currently thirteenth in the league with one hundred and fifty four goals for. But that was never their problem with scoring goals. They're they have decent players across their roster, which we'll talk about in a little bit when we talk about their stats. Goals against is where it gets far worse, though. 183 goals against at the moment. Stark contrast to the Boston Bruins. They are 31st out of 32 teams in the NHL in goals against at the moment, which is uh, one big reason why, obviously, they are not currently a better NHL team at the moment. You need to kind of... And, as important as it is to score goals, you also need to score more goals than the other team, which more goals more goals are being scored against them at the moment. So, yeah, that was great analysis on my part. But uh, looking up and down these stats, you wouldn't think that Vancouver would be a losing team at the moment. You look at their contributors at the moment. Elias, Elias Pettersson, 54 points in 44 games. He has been playing fantastically. Bo Horvat, their captain, 49 points in 46 games. That's also 30 goals to go along with that. So he's also in the top 10 in goals for the NHL at the moment. Quinn Hughes also doing great things. He's a point per game right now amongst defensemen, 42 points in 42 games played. He's played pretty well, although I'll talk about it in my segment, but I feel like he's been kind of invisible so far this year, but we'll talk about that in a little while. Um the rookie, Andre Kuzmenko, uh, 41 points in 45 games so far. We could be talking about Kuzmenko as a potential Calder uh, finalist come year's end. Uh, JT Miller, 41 points in 46 games. And trust me, we'll be getting back to him. But the problem is there's a fall off after JT Miller, where JT Miller has scored 41 points in 46 games. Brock Besser is your next point getter with 27 points in 38 games. And then Ilya Mikheyev is after that with 26 points in 43 games. Spreading the wealth is up and down the roster. We're going to talk about how the roster is currently built uh, on their lines, but it's not good. And where it gets even worse is their goaltending because, first of all, Thatcher Demko is on IR. I'm not quite sure when he's coming back, but even when he was healthy, was not doing very well at all. 15 starts three wins, 10 losses, two overtime losses. He had an 883 save percentage and a 393 goals against average to boot. It sucks to see for a guy who's not a bad goaltender either. He's a really talented goaltender who should be doing so much more at the moment. But then what's been a relief of Thatcher Demko has also been a different story. Spencer Martin, who's been stepping in for him, has been doing the best that he possibly can, but just can't really step into that starters role. 24 starts on the season, 11 wins, 12 losses, one overtime loss to boot, 877 save percentage and a 386 goals against. Sadly, Colin Delia, who has seen the most limited amount of time, like the least amount of time at the moment, in seven starts, he's four and three with an 897 save percentage and a 318 goals against. Just bad, bad, bad up and down for the Vancouver Canucks at the moment. And as we found out on our scroll down below, the Vancouver Canucks have 
uh, as of this morning, relieved Bruce Boudreaux of his head coaching duties. They have since hired Rick Tockett to uh, be the head coach for the remainder of this year. And they have also fired their assistant coach, uh, their support system as well. And they have hired Adam Foote as their assistant coach with Sergey Gonchar coming on as a defensive specialist for the Vancouver Canucks on the coaching staff. So a lot of familiar names there, a lot of former NHL player names. For those of you that are a fan of the NHL in the 90s, Tom, let's start with you here. There's a lot to dissect here for the Vancouver Canucks. Where did it start? What's the problem here with the Vancouver Canucks? How can it improve, if at all, for this season? What's your thoughts on the Vancouver Canucks season so far, especially since I know you're a bit of a homer for the Vancouver Canucks as like a second favorite team uh, versus the uh, New York Rangers for you? Funny part about it is I was asked a few weeks ago by somebody, if there weren't the Rangers, who would you be a fan of? And it actually wouldn't be the Canucks. Tell you the truth, I probably would be a Bruins fan, to be honest with you. That's weird. Oh, Why? Because like it's like, that's like saying, you know what? I'm not going to root for the Jedi's. I'm, I'm I'm a firm Darth Vader fan. Hey, listen, I wasn't around in the early 70s in the days of Bobby Orr and Brad Park and the fights up in the blue seats where they would steal people from Boston's jackets and light them on fire in the stairwells and stuff. Wasn't around for that. The Rangers and the Bruins in my lifetime were never in the same division and were never huge rivals like they were back in the 70s. I have no problem with Boston. I have no problem with the Bruins. I've been in Boston on a game day around Quincy Market and Faneuil Hall by the Boston Garden, or the correct term, the TD Garden. And I think it's a really cool experience, to be honest with you. I think it's a really cool experience. I got to check it well, out myself at some point. We're going to um, uh, move on from that right now. And the short answer about these Vancouver Canucks, who the people in Vancouver still hate the Boston Bruins from 2011 is I really don't know what the what, what the answer would be how to fix this. It's a team on paper that has the talent and the depth. A team that plays in a division where they very well should be competing with these other teams there. I think that this answer comes from the top down, which could be the case for the entire history of the Vancouver Canucks and all the problems that they've had over the years. You brought in Boost Boudreaux last year as, okay, a what the hell, let's try it move. We have to get rid of Travis Green because we thought that might be the problem. And when the front office brought him in, I'm not, you know, I'm not so sure that they really wanted him. And when things went wrong, they were looking for any reason to dump him. The problem with that is it's like a Vegas type thing with Gallant. Gallant was not Vegas' first choice. It was DeBoer. Well, DeBoer had a job already with a good team in San Jose. So Gallant was their guy until San Jose fired DeBoer. So then they just got rid of Gallant the first chance they could. And maybe this is the same type of situation here. But when he took over last year, his winning percentage was right up there with some of the better teams in the league. And if he would have been there over to full 82 last year, they would have probably, they would have finished second in, in, the, in the Pacific and made the playoffs and had the home ice advantage. So I go back to what I just said earlier. How can you dump a guy who achieved that? The short answer is you really can't. But I think myself and a lot of others thought if there's any sign of struggle here, the footsteps would start to get louder and louder and louder. Well, they got as loud as they possibly could be, and the team finally sacked him in the most peculiar way. This is like something along the lines of like European soccer when they tell a coach or a player, like when a player decides, oh, well, this will be my last year, and I agreed to another team in the middle of the season so you know they're leaving. Sort of the same thing. So they basically told him, well, you're basically fired. This will be your last game. Rick Tockett's going to be the new coach, and you'll be out of here at this point. I was listening to the hockey guy earlier, and maybe the right thing to do was fire him a couple weeks ago, throw an interim coach in there for the time being, and then hire Rick Tockett. I don't know why they didn't do that. But this is the Vancouver Canucks we're talking about. And throughout history, there's been a lot of uh, I don't know why they did that situations with moves that they've made. Yeah, I was here watching this team. Back in 2020, and I thought they were going to take huge strides, and maybe they'd be a big player in the West. They had a terrible situation in 2021 that I won't go into. I've talked about it before. They had a bad travel schedule. But they just never, ever took the next step. Yet again, this is a huge head-scratcher with these front office moves. They did it backwards. They brought Boudreaux and his coach. Then they brought in their GM. And then they brought in Jimmy Rutherford as the president usually you do that the other way around. 
You bring in the president, then the GM, then the coach. Or you just bring in the GM who doubles as the president, and then you bring in a coach. Usually it doesn't go that way. But like I said, throughout the history of the Canucks, does this surprise you at all? In 1997, when they fired Tom Rennie as coach, they brought Mike Keenan in to replace him as coach, and Pat Quinn was still the GM. Until Keenan pretty much told Vancouver ownership, I will only take this job if I get the coach and the GM tags at the same time. So what they basically did was they fired Pat Quinn as the GM but let him stay on as president, but he wasn't allowed to do anything. And Mike Keenan wore both hats, and Pat Quinn was just sitting there as a ceremonial guy. Maybe it was the best thing for Pat Quinn because then he went off to Toronto and had and, and had some nice teams over there. And then the following year, they told Mike Keenan, guess what? You're not the GM anymore. Brian Burke is. So Mike Keenan said, oh, okay, but I still have um, – I still have personnel decisions, right? Because in my contract, it said, even as head coach, I still have a say in player personnel. Like, yeah, no, you don't have that anymore. That's all Brian Burks. So how does that make any sense? Now, I'm going to harken back to another thing with the hockey guy. He's pretty much said that the people in Vancouver aren't patient with this team. Okay, but why can't they be patient? This team never won a Stanley Cup was basically a doormat until Pat Quinn took over in the 90s. Basically, this would be a team, this would be the first round series for Edmonton or Calgary to come in and get the guys into playoff shape for, for the for the harder rounds coming up. They always seem to have good teams but gloss over important things. You look at the 2011 team with the Sedins and then Kessler, but then you got beyond that, they didn't have all that much. You know, they seem to drive the right people away and give the money to the wrong ones. They backed Wayne Gretzky into a corner in 1996, called him at 2 o'clock in the morning, and the owner, John McCourt, said to Pat Quinn, you need to call him right now, and either he's in or he's not on the team. So when he told Gretzky that, said, well, good luck, guys. I'm not signing with you. But then the next year, threw a boatload of money at a declining Mark Messier, and I'm sure the Canucks fans remember that all too well about how great Mark Messier was for those Canucks. I get that Vancouver, if you look at the city itself, it's not like, say, in the wintertime of Montreal or a Toronto or an Edmonton where there's 17 feet of snow on the ground from November till sometime in April. I get that the weather's a little nicer. And when the team is bad and the nicer weather, the fans don't show up. But to be honest, the patience factor needs to be paramount here. But the way things are set up right now, I'm not sure it can be. I'm positive Bo Horvat is gone by the trade deadline. But are they going to get a good enough return for him? And don't get me wrong, Horvat's a good player. But I don't think he's going to fetch you a King's Ransom over there. I'm telling you, I don't think so. Hell, they barely fetch a King Ransom with Pavel Bore. They got Ed Jovanovsky, but that was really it. And if they're bad enough to tank and get Connor Bedard, then what do you really do? Do you tear the team up and make it Bedard's team? Or do you kind of keep it the way it is where you keep guys like Brock Bezer and Quinn Hughes and Elias Pedersen around like Tampa Bay did with Stamkos, where they – kept San Luis around and Le Cavalier around and the like. And here's the thing with Tampa. It didn't work right away with them, but eventually it did. Eventually they got better, made the playoffs, down the line won a couple Stanley Cups. But if it doesn't work out right away, are the fans in Vancouver going to be calling for management's heads again? Are they going to be calling for Rutherford's head? And is Rutherford going to start sending Elias Pedersen and Quinn Hughes elsewhere and make a Connor Bedard team if he, in the, if he indeed does draft them? Honestly, what this ownership really needs to do is they need to go back and look at the Pat Quinn era in the early 90s and the Brian Burke era in the early 2000s when this team had some structure and did things the right way and built up competitive teams. Did they win the Stanley Cup? No, but they built up competitive teams. And a lot of times winning the Cup is luck of the draw. And I think that – and it's luck of the draw and it's being serious and focused. And that 2011 team, 11 team I thought would win it, but obviously against the aforementioned Boston Bruins – they forgot that you actually have to go out there and win four games to win the Stanley Cup and not three and, you know, have to actually give the same effort on the road as you do at home. But the reality is with Vancouver right now, it's still a mess. I, I, I they, they did this whole thing backwards. And once again, here we are. Here we are. They're paying for it. And you heard my historical examples before. And it just seems like they never learned from what they did in the past. Yeah. I don't even know where to start right now for the Vancouver Canucks. I think the first place I want to start with, I mean, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention one thing that Tom was talking about before that they'll probably trade Bo Horvat. 
the word on the street is that Jim Rutherford is Jim Rutherford, the general manager of the Vancouver president, Canucks, president. president of the Vancouver Canucks. He's not, uh, he's fine with negotiating with anybody right now on any player except for Elias Pettersson. It seems like the only untouchable player right now for the Vancouver Canucks is Elias Pettersson. That means that every other name is out there and can be negotiated for. Bo Horvat is going to be an expiring free agent at the end of this year who's going to be a UFA at the beginning of the offseason this year. Could be a highly coveted center coming into the offseason as well. Uh, A lot of teams I know would gladly take his services at the moment. Brock Besser could be an interesting piece. Connor Garland could be an interesting piece as well. Quinn Hughes, absolutely, but that's going to take a King's Ransom to go go and get him. But there are a number of players that could be uh, jettisoned from this Vancouver roster uh, by the trade deadline in a month and a half at the moment. But we, I mentioned before with Boston's lineup and part of their success was how their lineup is currently built and how their lines are currently built that facilitate the success. It's kind of the opposite right now for the Vancouver Canucks. And I kind of want to show this off right now, courtesy of daily face off because you look up and down and how these pairings are. And it's a two line team at the moment. You got JT Miller, Bo Horvat, and Connor Garland on that top line. Fantastic top line, first of all. Like, that is a very good first line in the NHL in general. JT Miller, Bo Horvat, Connor Garland. Ton of talent. You look at that second line. Andre Kuzmenko, Elias Pettersson, Brock Besser. Fantastic second line. That honestly might be one of the more talented second lines in all in the entire NHL. That's a top 10 second line to me. But then it drops off significantly. And yes, I do understand that when we look down at IR at the moment for the Vancouver Canucks, yes, I understand Tanner Pearson's currently hurt. I know that that hurts their depth at the moment. You know, on defense, Tucker Pullman's currently hurt. That hurts their depth, and I understand that. But Ilya Mikheyev, Sheldon Drees, or Drees rather, and Jack Studnika, it's a pretty weak third line to me. That's a pretty weak third line. Then the fourth line, I think, gets even weaker with Dakota Joshua, Curtis Lazar, and Will Lockwood. And yes, I again, I understand that Tanner Pearson would factor somewhere in here, but I also don't think that that will really, really help here. I think you need to balance these lines a little bit better. I think you need to consider maybe using Ilya Mikheyev in the top six and bump one of those six names in the forward group in the top six down. Maybe you move Connor Garland down to the third line and try to work, work around a little bit. Maybe you move JT Miller down to that third line and try to get something going in that third line. Maybe on the fourth line, maybe that gives you the opportunity to at that point, maybe move Jack Stadnika down to that fourth line, kind of help out and maybe create something in that fourth line. These lines just are not balanced. It's very top heavy. And then we look down at the defense. Quinn Hughes really doesn't have support. You know, we've got Quinn Hughes and Luke Shen together. And Luke Shen is a is a perfectly fine defenseman, but you need somebody of equal quality to Quinn Hughes to really compliment him. And he doesn't have that in Luke Shen. Maybe a few years ago, Luke Shen had that, but not now. Shen, and, I heard, is pretty much good as gone at the deadline as well. Yep, he's going to be another name that will likely uh, be a Mike Commodore, pack your bags uh, candidate. And yes, I am censoring myself there. Um the second pairing, I again, lineup balance here. Oliver Ekman Larson and Tyler Myers should be far away from each other in terms of defensive pairings. You've got to separate the pylons there. You've got two orange traffic cones on that second pairing. And I don't know why it was thought that that would be a good idea. You know, maybe you move you know, Tyler Myers down to the third pairing, move Ethan Bear up for a little bit more mobility. Maybe you move Alvar ekman Larson up to the top pairing to pair with Luke Shen and move Quinn Hughes down with Tyler Myers so that way there's a little bit more mobility on that defensive pairing. But I said it even coming into the season, I didn't like that defensive pairing, and I think it's honestly 
kind of shown a little bit. I don't like that defensive pairing. And then Travis Dermott and Ethan Bear, that's a perfectly fine third pairing, but at that point, it's kind of moot when your top four is underwhelming. And then, again, the power play units are fine. They have no problem scoring goals at the moment. Penalty kill, again, fine. It's the goaltending that's the problem at the moment. Even when Thatcher Demko was healthy, he was not good. Spencer Martin, Colin Delia, not the greatest of goaltenders. You grin and bear it. You grit your teeth and try to get through it. But at the end of the day, you know, the systems that were put in place were not very good as well. I feel bad for Bruce Boudreaux because he did not deserve to be jettisoned the way that he was jettisoned from the Vancouver Canucks. It seemed like he had built a very good rapport with his players, but it also just seems like to me that that locker room has been toxic uh, since the middle of last year. And I'll just come out and say it just because I've been reading a lot about this particular player and it just really seems like Jim Rutherford hitched his wagon to the wrong guy. JT Miller is an absolute cancer in that locker room at the moment. He has been a narcissistic, arrogant, you know, can do no wrong type of player who has been playing very selfishly and acting very selfishly for this team for the past year and a half since he got his, you know, big contract. And it's sad to see Tony (laughs) D'Angelo. Yeah. And he's been, if you don't believe me on this one, go and go and find some of his post game pressers. They are really difficult to watch and frustrating to watch. If you're a Vancouver fan and he is slowly becoming public enemy. Number one in Vancouver. He's a good player. The rain, but but look at him. The Rangers had no problem. Jettison him off. Tampa had no problem getting rid of him. Yeah. So uh, the right from the wall, just like a very talented player. But you know, if the head is not there, if his head isn't all the way in on committing to this team and committing to winning, what does it matter? It's just pad static. It's just stat padding at that point. Yeah. You know, it's, you got to have players that play for each other. And JT Miller does not play for the rest of his players. It seems like, it seems like Bo Horvat is a guy that would literally die on the ice for the rest of his players. And they're about to trade him at the deadline after they should have gotten him that contract extension last year, instead of JT Miller to me, at least, I mean, Vancouver fans certainly chime in down below. You can tell me I'm wrong. You can tell me I'm right, but it just seems like it starts there with the attitude. And it seems like this team needs an attitude adjustment at the current moment. And it's not even just with head coaching. It's not with the coaching. Jim Rutherford has just not assembled this team correctly. As Tom alluded to before, he did everything in a very disorganized way and just a very fast backwards way. I don't blame Jim Rutherford for this. I don't. Jim Rutherford has, is a proven winner everywhere he's gone. But here's what they did wrong. They hired Boudreaux as your interim coach. This is ownership's fault. You brought in Boudreaux. Then you brought in Patrick Alvin as your GM. Then you brought in Jim Rutherford as your president, who I'm not 100% sure wanted to keep Boudreaux around. But then they told him, well, you don't have a choice. You have to keep him. So how can you run your team if your ownership is telling you what to do? It's the same thing like with these delusional Ranger fans who jump on Gerard Galano. All the time. Well, he got fired in Florida. He got fired in Florida because Florida Florida hired an analytics department and told them who to play, where to play them, and how long to play them. So how can you coach a team? It's the same thing with delusional Devils fans that say, oh, it starts with Lindy. Lindy Lindy's got to go. It hasn't been Lindy. It hasn't been Lindy's fault whatsoever. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hearken it back to another sport right now, to football, to Vince Lombardi. When he was coaching in Green Bay, as we know, the Green Bay Packers – are not a sole proprietorship. They're owned by shareholders and stakeholders. He was called into a meeting one day by the shareholders and the stakeholders and said, this is who we would like. This is who you're going to play the first game. This is where we want him to play. You know what he said? He ripped the paper apart and said, I'll coach the goddamn team. Thank you very much. And walked out. Yeah. And it's true. It's it's direct parallels to that. I do feel bad for Bruce Boudreaux. This could have been his last rodeo with the team. I don't know if I foresee Bruce Boudreaux hooking on as a head coach in the NHL again. And if this is the way he goes out, it sucks. It really, really sucks. Cause it's, it's, it really did not seem like to me that this was on him. Um, 
I obviously there's blame to point at both sides right now with coaching, with the players, with the front office. But it really just seems like to me that the Vancouver Canucks at the moment just need an enema. They need to hit a hard reset at the moment. And uh, it could very well be time to jettison some key pieces, get younger, retool, and try to get back in Elias Pettersson's window at the moment and you know build around. Honestly, if I'm Vancouver, I build around three players at the moment. There are three players that I would build around. I would build around Elias Pettersson. I would build around Quinn Hughes. I would build around Thatcher Demko because even with Thatcher Demko's shortcomings, he is still a very good goaltender who has not had the best system in place in front of him. And we've seen time and time again for some goaltenders that, you know what? Sometimes you're dealt a bad hand. You know, Henrik Lundqvist had to deal with tons of terrible defenses in front of him for years to finally actually do no, that, that, nice. other, other way around. Other way around. Lundqvist didn't have... Lundqvist didn't have top six guys who were a point per game or over in the regular season in the playoffs. Lundqvist had some great defensemen in front of him, McDonough, McDonough, Girardi, and Stahl. What he didn't have was a point per game center on line one or two or a point per game winger. He didn't have that. He had Gabrick who could score a lot of goals. He had Nash who could score a lot of goals. He had Marty San Louis who was a good player but on the older side. But what he never had was that offensive support. Yeah, you had the same you have the same thing also with Carey Price. You had the same thing with Corey Schneider once he got to the Devils as well. You know, just bad after bad after bad after bad. And it's no different here for Thatcher Demko in my opinion. I think Thatcher Demko is a very honestly, I think he's not a name that when you mention the other three names that I mentioned before that he's in that conversation but I think maybe by the career's end we could be talking. I think that I think if you bring Lundqvist up, it's maybe similar to the first part of his career when Tom Rennie was coach, where you had guys like Nylander and Straka and Yager and Shanahan up front who were point per game guys who turned it on when the playoffs came around. But then on D, you had guys like Malik and Roosevelt and Fetter Tootin and Tom, Thomas Polk and guys like that who weren't necessarily bad defensemen, but weren't regarded as some of the best in the league weren't Norris trophy candidates. You know what I'm saying? That's true. Either way, uh, my heart breaks for Vancouver at the moment. I wish, you know, the city of Vancouver, all the best as they navigate through the rest of this very difficult NHL season. It's not, it's, it's gotta get worse before it gets better and take it from a devil's fan. Uh, that saw a rebuild, take it from a Rangers fan. that saw a short rebuild as well. It's gotta get worse before it gets better. And uh, buckle up, buy some beer, and uh, just try to enjoy the ride for right now. It's going to be bumpy for sure. But before we go right now, let's get to our question of the day, which got two questions of the days. It's a two-for-one special because we're talking about a tale of two cities. So first question is, ultimately, will the Boston Bruins win the President's Trophy? And will the Vancouver Canucks turn it around this season with Rick Tockett at the helm? Tom, let's start, start with you. I don't want to start with one thing real quick. It's kind of a burn against both teams. Don't kill me for this. I mentioned how the Bruins are on pace to win 65 games this year. And I mentioned how, you know, Detroit and Tampa have the record at 62 apiece and couldn't do it. The only team to ever win 60 plus and win a couple of the 77 Montreal Canadiens, a thorn in the Bruins side who swept those same Boston Bruins in the Stanley Cup finals that year on a goal by one of your favorite Jacques Lemaire in overtime to win it. Now, to go to the Bruins side, the Bruins in 2014 were everybody's Stanley Cup favorite, including mine, and those same Montreal Canadiens took the Stanley Cup away from those Bruins by beating them in seven games. But guess who the Boston Bruins' first-round draft pick that year was? David Pasternak. Now, guess who would have drafted Pasternak in theory if the Bruins would have won the Stanley Cup? Who? The Vancouver Canucks, who had Pittsburgh's pick that year. So if the Bruins would have won the cup, Pasternak would be wearing Canucks colors right now and not Bruins colors, unless the management found a way to trade up for the 25th pick. But that's something we can talk about another day. Short answer again, Bruins, President's Trophy, yes. Vancouver, turn it around. I don't know. Probably not. Yeah, to me, I'll keep it short and sweet also. Uh, for Boston, it would take a an epic collapse for them not to win the President's Trophy at the current moment. There are certainly a few teams that could – challenge to catch him which uh 
could be the Montreal, uh, not Montreal, could be the Toronto Maple Leafs, could be the Carolina Hurricane, although them just losing Max Pacioretty certainly hurts. Could even be the New Jersey Devils, but I just don't see their consistency, you know, staying to get to the point where maybe they could catch Boston in this race. Those are the only three teams that I think are even likely at the moment to try to catch the Boston Bruins at the current moment at where the season currently stands. But yeah, I see Boston as the president's trophy winner. I don't foresee Vancouver turning around with Rick Tockett. I think they are just going to put on, put on a good face, you know, for the franchise moving forward. Maybe hope that Rick Tockett is the answer for the future uh, for a younger team and developing team. And uh, we're going to see a number of names possibly cast off in Vancouver Canucks as the next month and a half rolls on. And we'll be here to you know give you the rest of the news with that as well as talk at talk about some trade targets. But next week we're going to be talking about our midseason review, talk about the rest of the teams in the NHL since we already brought up the Boston Bruins and the Vancouver Canucks. You're probably wondering how the rest of the teams in the NHL are doing. So we're going to bring you that next week, talk about who's been doing good hockey things, who's been doing bad hockey things. But for now... Let's move away from this. If you enjoyed this, make sure to subscribe down below, youtube.com slash i80sports. Hit the bell notification so that way you know when we go live. And also make sure you comment down below. What do you think about Boston season? What do you think about Vancouver season? Let us know. Join the conversation down below. And if you're on Twitter, make sure you follow us down below at i80 underscore sports NHL. And if you follow us already, thank you guys so much because we greatly value all of your support. Without you guys, we can't do this on a weekly basis. But Time to watch more hockey. Time to watch Boston win some more. Time to watch Vancouver possibly lose some more. But for now, I'm Brian. He's Tom. This has been yet another episode of NHL on IED Sports.